So let's solve this problem. We have water behind a dam and it has an intake inlet right here at state one and the pressure at state one P1 is given to be 170 kPa and the velocity V1 of 10 meters per second flows through a hydraulic turbine generator. Here's our turbine. Here's our generator. The purpose of that hydraulic turbine generator is to generate electric power. That's what's shown here. So that's what's coming out. You could put it like that or you could put it like this and put W dot coming out and then the form of electricity. Okay. It exits down here is where it exits at state two. And at the point uh, it exits Z1 is 35 meters below the intake so you could either set Z2 and that's probably the most logical the location Z2 is 0 set that sort of as a datum point for the elevation and then show this as only going up and then Z1 is 35 meters above the exit so the inlet is 35 meters, Z1 is 35 meters, Z2 is 0. Okay, then you have the pressure. Uh, P2 is given to be 130 kPa. And the V2 of 18 meters per second of velocity. And it has a specific volume. Now I'm going to put the specific volume of the water right here. V and it's 0 0.001 meter cubed per kilogram. We read the whole problem and there's no information that we're supposed to treat the water as an incompressible substance. But there's really no alternative. And we know from experience water is very incompressible. It's a liquid. And so we're going to treat the water as incompressible. There's a few uh, ramifications of this one is is that the specific volume is constant there's no change it's not like the specific volume at the inlet state one is different than the specific volume at the exit state two it's just always the specific volume of 0 0.001 meter cube per kilogram all right continuing to read the problem we have the diameter of the exit pipe d at the exit is 1.5 meter. Do they give us the diameter at the inlet? No. No diameter at the inlet. Only diameter at the exit. And the local acceleration of gravity, we'll put that right here, G is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. All right. The electricity generated has a value of 8.5 pennies or 8.5 cents per kilowatt hour. We can write that a couple different ways, but I would say just the value of the electric energy, so value per unit energy, is equal to, and I'd put it in dollars, 0.085 dollars is exactly 8.5 cents per kW.h. And that's the favorite unit in the United States and probably throughout the world in which they sell electricity. It's sold in units of kilowatt hour so it's the kilowatts times one hour duration. Okay, determine the value of the electricity produced in a dollars per day for operation if the, if the dam is running at steady state and in the absence of internal irreversibilities. So the turbine has no internal irreversibility. Sigma dot the turbine zero. The generator, sigma dots, zero. The flow in the pipe, sigma dots, zero. No internal irreversibilities. And they give us this dashed line indicating a control volume. And the control volume includes the turbine generator and all the piping. So here's the answer that we expect. About $17,600 per day is the value of that electricity. So what we need to do is... Um, try to organize our work. What I'm going to do is copy this illustration and move it to a clean page and not include all of the wording at the top so I have more work, space to work in. So hopefully this copies. 
So we moved it to a new page so we have a little more room to work with. So first thing we want to do is we want to think about, well, they want this maximum out, so new, no irreversibility. So what does the second law look like for this system? Second law of thermodynamics. It's basically an entropy balance equation. And, well, they gave us a control volume, so let's just apply it for that control volume. So the rate of change of entropy stored in the control volume with respect to time. Well, it's steady state, so that term is equal to zero. Well, there's an inflow across the boundary of that uh, control volume if there's a heat transfer across the boundary of the control volume, and that's the rate at which it's flowing in or out of positive Q dot in, it brings entropy. If it's positive Q dot out, it removes entropy. But there's no information in the problem statement about the heat transfer. So you have to assume Q dot's zero unless something else is given in the problem statement to give you information that it's not zero. And then we're going to have our mass flow rate coming in is the same as a mass flow rate going out. So it's just going to be bringing its entropy and taking its entropy. And then you could have a whole pile of irreversibilities. And so we're going to sum all the sources of irreversibilities in the piping, in the turbine, in the generator, wherever. Now, in reality, that generator may be hot and there may be dissipation of heat off of that generator but there's no information to allow us to quantify it likewise the turbine bearings may get hot and may be dissipation of heat to the surroundings but there's no information to quantify it so at this point you would say to get the maximum out we would naturally assume no irreversibilities again no heat transfer steady state so we conclude that S2 minus S1 is equal to zero, the change in entropy. Well, what does S2 minus S1 look like for an incompressible substance like liquid water? It'd be a specific heat natural log of T2 over T1. Well, how can I get that to be equal to zero? Either the specific heat is zero, not realistic, or the natural log of T2 over T1 is zero. That's very realistic. And what we conclude from the second law is that the exit temperature must equal the inlet temperature. It's not, it's not hotter going out, hence carrying with it entropy due to irreversibilities or whatever. So this is the conclusion from the second law. Let's now go ahead and write the first law. So the first law, the rate of change of energy in a control volume with respect to time. Professor, it's steady state. I know it's zero. I don't like to write it all that often either, but there it is. Q dot flowing in. Professor, we just talked about that. There's no heat transfer in or out of that system. The Q dots are zero. We have plus the W dot electric, and I'm going to leave off the subscripts, or I could write the, the subscripts, E-L-E-C, something like that. But that's naturally going out of the system, and they're showing it in this illustration with that plus minus, you know, two lines, electric like copper wire lines okay then we have the same mass flow rate in and out and then we have carrying with it its enthalpy coming in and taking with it its enthalpy out whoops that's a minus sign then we have our um, kinetic energy in minus our specific kinetic energy out and our potential energy in minus our specific potential energy out so if you're interested, this is not a plus, it's a minus in front of that power because it's an out, the power is out. So we can rewrite this as W dot is equal to M dot times. And now we're going to expand this H. And so over here on the side, we remind ourselves H, the enthalpy, is defined in terms of U plus PV. The pressure could change, but not the specific volume. So you can replace this H1 minus H2 by U1 minus U2 plus V times P1 minus P2. That's how we replace for the enthalpy. And then we have one half. I'm going to put V1 squared minus V2 squared for the change in the specific kinetic energy. And then we're going to have g times z1 minus z2 and end 
Okay, so now we go back and we say, well, from the second law, we concluded that T2 is equal to T1 because it's an incompressible substance model for liquid water. Well, the same thing for internal energy. If somebody says, what's the change in internal energy? I would say it's some specific heat change in temperature. But we just concluded that the change in temperature is zero. So what is any value of specific heat times zero is still zero. So this term is zero. All right. No change in temperature, hence there's no change in internal energy for the incompressible liquid water. All right, so we can play with this some more. You can get the mass flow rate. Let me doodle over here on the side. The mass flow rate is the volumetric flow rate, AV. Now you could look at it and say I can either calculate it at state 1 or at state 2. Because they give me the diameter at 2 and not the diameter at 1, it's better to calculate A2 and V2 and then divide by the specific volume at 2, which is just a specific volume. All right. So our area at 2 is pi D2 squared over 4. And there's our diameter. And our velocity at 2, V2, is given right here. What is that? 18 meters per second. And you divide by the specific volume, we can calculate that mass flow rate. The mass flow rate comes in at 31809 kilograms per second. So 31,800 kilograms per second. That's the mass flow rate. So it's like, okay, we got that. Check. Specific volume, got it. How about our pressures? P1 is 170 kPa. P2 is 130 kPa. Very good. How about our velocities? V1, 10 meters per second. V2 is 18 meters per second. One of the things, if we want these units to work, typically we want this in like kilojoules per kilogram on this term. We would like this in kilojoules per kilogram. So remember the unit conversion, the unit conversion that 1,000 meters squared per second squared is precisely one kilojoule per kilogram. We've used that conversion factor a lot. So use that conversion factor right here as well as right there on these two terms to make sure all three are in kilojoules per kilogram and then you add them together. But let's continue. Do we know G? Yes, 9.81. Do we know Z1? 35. C2, 0. Okay, so I'm going to give you some numbers here. So we've got the mass flow rate, and let me just write that in, 31809 oh, kilograms per second. The change in the uh, energy associated with the change in the pressure, P1 to P2, not a large value, 0 0.040 kilojoules per kilogram. I'm going to convert all these to kilojoules per kilogram and add them together. How about the change in the kinetic energy? Negative 0 0.112 kilojoules per kilogram. How about the change in potential energy? Plus 0 0.343. Um, yeah, that's enough. But there's another 4 out here. If you wanted to, there was a 0 here, and there's another 0 there. there that way they're all shown to be um, 4 digits after the decimal place. In all units of kilojoules per kilogram, notice one of them is negative. It did slow down. It, it, um, well, no, it's not that it slowed down. It sped up, which means it has higher kinetic energy at the exit, so there's less power going out. Okay. You add them together, you do the math, and the power comes in at 8631 kilowatts. Okay, so now we say, well, I want it for a day. How much energy is it per day, D-A-Y? Well, you would take the 8631 kilowatts and you multiply it by one day is 24 hours, so you multiply by 24 hours divided by one day, so that 
turns out to be so many kilowatt hours, 207 comma 150 kwh per day that are developed. Now you want to know the value, and I wish I could have fit it all on here, but I need to scoot it down a little bit. So we have the value per day is equal to how much is the energy per day multiplied by the cost or the value. We put value per energy. All right, so we have the 207150 kwh produced per day and then you sell it for this many dollars or eight and a half cents per kwh the kwh is canceled and you're left with what is that dollar value per day of operation of this plant it's about seventeen thousand six hundred dollars whoops put dollar over here per day Get rid of the dollar there. And that's our final answer. We look back. And, yep, there you go. It agrees. So we're done. Thank you.